They were both hunted as babies to be killed. They were both shepherds. They were both royalty. They both had placements as infants into a scene that we can visualize because we were given so many details. They were both used by God to deliver God's people. Who am I speaking about? Moses and Jesus. Only Jesus is the great shepherd because Jesus is God. And he was God in the flesh. Today, we are looking again at the life of Moses and seeing some of the similarities in this foreshadow. Thank you for joining the Amazing Grace Bible Study today in part number four of the life of Moses. We finished up uh, in the last teaching in Exodus chapter 4. Today we're not going to read Exodus chapter 5, but I'm going to share with you all what actually does take place. So, Moses and Aaron, they do arrive in Egypt and they do tell Pharaoh that God wants them to let his people go. But God actually requests that his people just go out into the wilderness for three days, that they may worship God and they may have a feast out in the wilderness for three days. But Pharaoh's heart is hardened and he's not going to let the people go. And he says, who is this God of Israel? I don't know who he is. No, I'm not going to let the people go. And he refuses to let the people go. And in fact, what he ends up doing is he makes their work much harder, much harder. The people are making bricks and they're constructing things. You know, the Hebrew people were slaves to the Egyptians. There were these 12 tribes of Israel and they were, con they were constructing things. They were building things. And one of the things that, that the Pharaoh had said is that now, because Moses and Aaron had come and said that, that God had asked that the people get to leave for three, just three days to go out, out into the wilderness to have a feast and to, to serve and worship God for those three days, that he actually was not going to let them go and he was going to make it harder. And what he told the taskmasters and the Egyptian people to do to the Hebrew people, to the Hebrew slaves, is to no longer provide them with the straw to for the fire to make the bricks. They would have to go out into the wilderness and get their own straw. It was now going to be like a stubble that they would have to go and gather themselves. But yet they were still required to provide the same amount of work, which they weren't able to do. And so they were beaten. So, so much more oppression was put on to them. They were required to provide the same amount of work, but they weren't able to, to do it because they weren't able to provide those bricks because they didn't have the resources no longer. And so Moses is upset about this and he goes to God and he says, you sent us here to tell Pharaoh, now we've gone to tell Pharaoh, now look what's happened to the people. This is what you see in chapter 5. And now look what's happened. Pharaoh has made it harder on them. So now let's pick up here in chapter 6 to see what happens and what God replies with. Then the Lord said unto Moses, verse 1 here in chapter 6, Then the Lord said unto Moses, Now shalt thou see what I will do, to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand shall he let them go, and with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty, but by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. And I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan 
the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with stretched out arm and with great judgments, and I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will bring you in unto the land concerning the which I did swear to give it to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and I will give it to you for an heritage. I am the Lord. And Moses spake so unto the children of Israel, but they hearkened not unto Moses for anguish of spirit and for cruel bondage. What happened? The children of Israel were under such pain and oppression because the oppressor, Pharaoh, the enemy, he had stepped things up so much upon the people and it was so hard. The people, they couldn't believe that things were gonna change. They thought, we're just gonna die here. We're not gonna be delivered out. That the words of Moses, when he came and told the people, they, they just didn't believe him. They were looking at their situation. And rightfully so, really. The people had been there for over 400 years in bondage and in slavery. And now it's worse. So it's easy to look at our situation when it's been that way for a long time. But God had a word that he had spoke to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. And he had made a covenant with Abraham and he had told him, that I will deliver the people and I will bring them to a land flowing with milk and honey and that he would deliver them from the bondage of the Egyptians that he had, he had swore to these forefathers that he would bring them out. Now, I want to look at two main points from the scripture and, and now we're able to see this first point. When was the first time that the oppressor that the enemy of God's people hears a word from God. In this, in this story, it's Pharaoh. He's the oppressor. He's the enemy. And the first time he hears a word was when Moses and Aaron first show up and say, just for three days, give the people a break. Let them have a feast. Let them go serve and worship God out in the wilderness. And what does the oppressor do? when he first hears that God wants to do something with his people, that God is speaking about his people, that God's saying anything about his people, he steps it up. He makes it harder on them. And believer, do not be surprised. Do not be surprised in 2024 because God uses this story so much as a foreshadow of things that were to come. We see this so much in Moses' life. Remember, Moses' placement even in, in the basket. We don't know of another infant besides baby Jesus, that there was so much detail of the placement of that baby, of that infant, of where his mother placed him, right? Baby Jesus in the manger, in the stable, and baby Moses in a basket in the River Nile, right? Baby Moses, you know, being hunted as an infant, you know, to be slain by a king. And then baby Jesus being hunted as a baby to be slain by, you know, King Herod at the time. Think about this. There's, there, there's so many similarities. They were, it, Moses was a foreshadow of things to come. And Pharaoh is a foreshadow, right, uh, for us as believers of understanding of the oppressor, the enemy, Satan. Although Satan was very much uh, already present on the earth, God uses this story for us as believers to r realize and recognize how the enemy works and how when God speaks a word about his people, 
when God is working in the lives of his people, how the enemy pays attention and he will always respond. He's going to always pay attention to that. And often in a way of placing more oppression. But, but here's what we can always know. The same thing. God is going to always step up for his people. What did we see God do? God said, I'm going to keep my promises. I'm going to keep my covenants. And God has spoken many words and many promises about his people. How many promises and how many words has God spoken, spoken about us as his people? Countless promises. And he keeps them all. So, he says, I will bring you into the land concerning the which I did swear to give to Abraham. This is the promise that had been given to these people at that time. But friends, we can look at scripture and find promise after promise after promise that has been given to us. And we can know that God is going to keep those for us. That is something that we can stand on. But we, just like the children of Israel, can look at our situation instead of looking at the promise, right? What do we know takes place? Well, we know God fulfills his covenant and he keeps the promise and he does deliver the people out. Even though the people are looking at their situation and they don't believe it, we know it actually happens, right? Let's read on. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Go in, speak unto Pharaoh king of Egypt, and that he let the children of Israel go out of his land. And Moses spake before the Lord, saying, Behold, the children of Israel have not hearkened unto me. How then shall Pharaoh hear me? Who am I of uncircumcised lips? And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, and gave them a charge unto the children of Israel and unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Now, it goes into some genealogy here, so we're going to skip over the last part of chapter 6 and go over to chapter 7 and read just a little bit of chapter 7, and we're closing today. In verse 1 of chapter 7, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh. Now, notice that's a lowercase g. And, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. This gets really interesting. So the first point we wanted to really see today is that when the enemy sees that God speaks a word about his people, do not be surprised that he doesn't step things up, that he doesn't send lots of oppression upon upon you when God speaks a word about you, right? The second point, now we're going to see. It says, And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, that he send the children of Israel out of his land. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. Now notice that God says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Now we've been speaking about this a little bit through our series just to remind you that God and his word have always been, right? Because God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit always have been, always will be. They had no beginning. They will have no end. They are all one being, right? God's word always has been. Now, God's spoken word, we know in the book of Hebrews chapter 3, says that sin hardens hearts. Okay, so God already spoke a word that sin would harden hearts. So God's word, right, says that sin hardens hearts. So it says, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart. We know that it's it's sin, it's Pharaoh's sin that hardens hearts. And God spoke that word. And I will, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. God said there in verse 3, verse 4, but Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you and I will lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth my armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt of great judgments. God said he's going to bring great judgments on, on Egypt. And the Egyptians shall, shall know that I am a Lord when I stretch forth mine hand upon Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. And Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded them. So did they. And Moses was fourscore years old and Aaron fourscore and three years old when they spake unto Pharaoh. So Moses is 80 and Aaron is 83. Now again, we're almost done here. We're going to read a few more verses beginning there. Verse 8 and we're going to read through verse 13. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying, 
when Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, Show a miracle for you, then thou shalt say unto Aaron, Take thy rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. Because remember, God is speaking to Moses, and then Moses speaks to Aaron, and then Aaron speaks to to the people and to Pharaoh. Remember, because Mo Moses didn't want to do it because he has a speech problem. So Aaron is the one who's going to be speaking to Pharaoh, even though Moses is the one that God is dealing with. And it, remember, it was Moses' rod that had the power in it, that God placed the power, uh, his power in. So it says in verse 9, When Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, Show a miracle for you, then thou shalt say unto Aaron, Take thy rod, which is Moses' rod, and cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. So it's going to become a snake. Verse 10, And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, now the magicians of Egypt. They also did in like manner with, with their enchantments. So now Moses and Aaron they did as the Lord commanded. They went in before Pharaoh. They brought the rod. They cast it down. It becomes a snake. They show this, this power. But then Pharaoh does the same thing. He calls in all his magicians and his sorcerers, and they, all of them, they bring in, and they do the same thing. And it goes on to say in verse 12, For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. So now they've done the same thing. They're doing magic. They're doing sorceries. How do they do that? Satan, the enemy. Think about this. But, that's a big word there in verse 12. But, but Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. So Aaron's snake goes and eats up all of theirs. And verse 13, and he hardens Pharaoh's heart that he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. There's going to be all these plagues that take place over Egypt. Terrible plagues. There's going to be ten. Um, and what we see here, first of all, when the enemy hears a word that God is speaking about his His people, or we see he, when the enemy sees that God's people is hearkening unto the Lord, or they're changing, God's moving your life, don't be surprised if he steps up the oppression uh, on you. If he pays attention to what God's doing to your life and he He tries to cause some problems, wreak some havoc, right? Second thing is that we want to pay attention to is don't be surprised that the enemy doesn't try to mimic what God does, but that God's power will always trump the enemies. So it's so important to know God's word. Okay? The enemy is going to try to mimic, even visually, what God is doing here on this earth. He's very sly. But God's power is always going to trump the enemies. And we have this, according to Ephesians chapter 6, every believer has it. We have a spiritual armor that can quench every fiery dart of the enemy. Right? We have it. It's not, it's not any, anything that we have to go and muster up. It's just something that we have. But we need to acknowledge we have it. We have to put it on. Scripture says it's something that we do need to be engaging with. How do we do that? Scripture teaches us how to do that in Ephesians chapter 6. We need to put it on. We need to be actively in this word. Y'all, we need to know Scripture. We need to be in the word of God. We need to be in the truth of the word of God so that we can know the difference. When Satan is trying to mimic something of that the Lord of God, right? When Satan is trying to mimic something that God is, has brought into our life, when he's trying to distract us and he's trying to mimic something, because he is going to try to play tricks. He's definitely going to try to do that. But there is only one God, and we need to know his word. And when we are active in studying the truth of his word, Satan, he, he will not be able to take us down, right? 
You gotta stay in that word. Remember, remember that God is for us. So who can be against us? We don't need to be afraid. But we definitely need to know. We need to study to show ourselves. Scripture says, study to show thyself approved. We've got to be in the word. You might be wondering, why is my life just falling apart? Or why are all these terrible things happening? Or whatever, right? Satan may be actively after you and engaging and in, in, in trying to oppress you in your life. But know this. You have a spiritual armor. Stay in that word. Stay in faith and you're going to be okay. And if you're not in the word, don't be surprised why things are not going so well. We got to be in the word, y'all. You know, we can't we can't be walking through this life without the good Lord. We need him because this is a, there is a definitely a spiritual battle taking place here, and we need to know it. I sure have enjoyed studying the life of Moses and seeing this foreshadowing through this life of Moses. Seeing it in that light is very, very interesting. Uh, thank you for joining.